Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on G-protein coupled receptors. In this video, what we want to do is introduce the G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, so we're going to discuss their basic structure, and then we'll discuss uh, the five subfamilies of G-protein coupled receptors. So we'll discuss the classification, and we'll discuss uh, examples of G-protein coupled receptors that are within each family. Okay, so uh, let's begin with the G-protein coupled receptors then. So firstly, um, G-protein coupled receptors, strictly speaking, you should have little dashes in between G and protein and in between protein and coupled, but often people will omit those. So G-protein coupled receptors. And they're also often abbreviated to G for G-proteins, P for protein, uh, C for coupled, and R for for receptor, so GPCRs. I should just add a little S there. Okay, now G protein coupled receptors also go by other names. Uh, they're also called seven transmembrane receptors. Okay, so this is one of their other names. And they're called this because they do indeed have seven transmembrane domains. They have seven membrane spanning alpha helices. Okay, so seven transmembrane receptors, and for short, seven transmembrane receptors can be abbreviated to seven TM for transmembrane and then receptors. Okay, um, and finally, another name for G protein coupled receptors is to call them metabotropic receptors. That's a name that often neuroscientists like to use for uh, G protein coupled receptors. Okay, so three different names, but they're all for the same type of receptor. Now, another thing to say is that the family of G protein coupled receptors is by far the biggest family of receptors in the human genome. It's the biggest superfamily of proteins in the human genome. There are over 800 G protein coupled receptors. Okay, so this is a massive, massive area of study. Uh, around 10,000 new papers come out every year on G protein coupled receptors. And about a well, good fraction of all drugs that are used in the clinic work uh, by interfering with G protein coupled receptors. So, this is a really important topic, basically. So, let's now discuss the basic structure of a G-protein coupled receptor. Okay, and I also want to discuss a little bit of nomenclature with you. So, basically, the basic structure that all of them have is they have their amino terminus on the extracellular uh, side of the membrane. So this is the plasma membrane here, the PM. It's the lipid by there, so that's what these two lines show. They show the outer leaflet and the inner leaflet. So this side is the extracellular fluid, this side is the cytoplasm. Okay, so you start with an amino terminus, then you have a membrane spanning alpha helix which straddles uh, the lipid by there. Then you have an intracellular loop uh, where the, uh, well, between the first membrane spanning alpha helix and the second membrane spanning alpha helix, and this is known as the intracellular loop 1. So this is called ICL1. And ICL, as I say, stands for intracellular. So the I is for intra, the C is for cellular, and then the L is for loop. So this is intracellular loop 1. Then, after the second membrane spanning alpha helix, and I should also tell you the name for uh, labeling the membrane spanning alpha helices. So, that naming, the, well, the labeling system for the membrane spanning alpha helices is to call them TMDs. Okay, and TMD stands for transmembrane domain. Okay, so the T is for trans, the M is for membrane, and then the D is for domain. Okay, so the first membrane spanning alpha helix is then called the transmembrane domain 1, so TMD1. The second membrane spanning alpha helix would then be TMD2, transmembrane domain 2, okay, and so on. Then between the second membrane spanning alpha helix and the third membrane spanning alpha helix, or between TMD2 and TMD3, you have your first extracellular loop. Now the symbols for extracellular loop are quite sensible, ECL for extracellular loop, so this stands for extracellular this time. The E is for extra, the C is for cellular, and then the L is for loop. 
Okay, so this is the first extracellular loop, so this is ECL1. Okay, and now we've had transmembrane domain 3 here, the third membrane spanning off helix. Then we've got the second intracellular loop, ICL2, between the third membrane spanning alpha helix and the fourth membrane spanning alpha helix. Then between the fourth and the fifth, you have the second extracellular loop. So this is extracellular loop two. Then you have the fifth membrane spanning alpha helix, TMD5. Then uh, the third and final intracellular loop here. So this is uh, the intracellular loop three, ICL3. Then the transmembrane domain 6, the extracellular loop 3, and the transmembrane domain 7. And then you finish with a carboxylic acid terminus uh, that is on uh, the cytoplasmic side of the membrane. So there's a bit of nomenclature. We have ICL, TMD, and ECLs. Okay, right. Uh, so, basically... This seven transmembrane structure is always conserved in all of these G-protein coupled receptors. And we don't know why nature found it and latched onto it so well. Why uh, is it always seven transmembrane domains, basically? Why is seven so important? We don't know the answer to that question. Okay, it's just a curiosity at the moment. Uh, right. Now, I also just want to discuss one more piece of terminology with you, which is how do you label uh, the amino acids within uh, the transmembrane domains? Because if you read the research literature, you'll find this all over the place. So I'm just going to explain that in a moment. Now, more generally, how do you label the amino acids in the protein? You might think, well, what is the point? It's very, very... Um, well, when you see this complicated notation that I'm about to show you, you might think, what's the point. You know, we label amino acids in proteins all the time. It's really, really simple. All you do is you have a protein here. Let's say this is our polypeptide here. And you start with the amino terminus here. So here's the amino terminus and here's the carboxylic acid terminus. You start counting the amino acids. So the first amino acid you call that amino acid 1. Then you go on. The second amino acid you call that amino acid 2. And you go on 3, 4, and you go on and on and on until the final one. Okay, and that's how you label the amino acids within the polypeptide. Now, in G-protein coupled receptors, people have a slightly more complicated uh, way of labeling the residues within the transmembrane domains. They do use this, but they add something on that just makes it more complicated than it needs to be, frankly. Okay, so basically, if I draw you a membrane-spanning alpha helix, and I'll actually draw it this time as an alpha helix. Okay, so I haven't drawn each of these as alpha helices, but in reality, all of these transmembrane domains, all seven of them, should be alpha helices. So all of these things that I've now highlighted in red, they should be alpha helices. So basically, let's say we have a uh, serine residue here. Okay, so let's say this is serine, and let's say its actual amino acid position from the amino terminus is position 207. Now, basically, we add a little bit of extra labeling on to show uh, which transmembrane domain it is in and about where in that transmembrane domain it actually is positioned, basically. So, let's say it's in the third transmembrane domain. So, let's say it's in this third one here. What you would then do is you'd put a free superscripted here to show that it's in the third transmembrane domain, but you do more than that. And then the next bit is the complicated bit. So, you put a little dash, and then you put another number here, and this other number is a bit more complicated. Okay, so basically, uh, in each type of G-protein coupled receptor, there are some residues which will always be conserved, basically. Okay, and basically you go through all of these transmembrane domains and you look for the most conserved amino acid. Okay, so let me explain this again. So... In each receptor type, and I'm talking about a specific G protein coupled receptor now. So let's say we're talking about the beta 2 adrenergic receptor. Okay? So there are different alleles for the beta 2 adrenergic receptor, so the adrenoreceptor. Okay? Uh, so 
you can have slightly different genes. If you go to the population, we will not all have absolutely identical genes for the beta-2 adrenoreceptor. We will therefore not all have exactly identical sequences of amino acids in these uh, polypeptides that make up the beta-2 adrenoreceptor. However, if you look at all of the beta-2 adrenergic receptors from the population, you will find that there are matches, i.e. that some amino acids match in absolutely all beta-2 adrenergic receptors. So some residues are always conserved. So basically, you go into each transmembrane domain, okay, and you find the most conserved amino acid residue there. So you'll pick some really conserved amino acid residues, okay, and you'll call these the conserved amino acid residues in the membrane-spanning alpha helices for the beta-2 adrenergic receptor which is sort of the archetypal example of a G-protein coupled receptor, okay? And now what you're going to do is enable all other um, residues within that membrane-spanning alpha helice according to where they are relative to this most conserved uh, amino acid residue, okay? So... Basically, what you do is you deem the conserved amino acid residue, so the residue that I've highlighted in blue, you deem that number 50. So if you were talking about the con really conserved amino acid residue, let's say the serine just happened to be the uh, conserved amino acid residue uh, at... Uh, well, in transmembrane domain 3 of the beta-2 adrenergic receptor, then I would then put a 50 here, okay? Now, if it was not at that position, basically, if it was either more towards the amino terminus than uh, that conserved residue at position 50, um, then I would go down. I would make this number smaller. So basically, let me show you, let me draw another picture. So if we've got our polypeptide that's folded around in this membrane-spanning alpha helix here, and let's say we have our really conserved amino acid here, okay? So this is the conserved amino acid within transmembrane domain 3 of the beta-2 adrenergic receptor. Basically, if my serine is still in transmembrane domain 3, but it's towards the amino terminus of this conserved amino acid, then what I need to do is I need to count down. So I'm going to call this number 50. It's not necessarily the 50th amino acid along the polypeptide. You just call it 50 uh, in this second naming system that we're talking about here. Okay, and then you count down. So the one just to the left of this really conserved residue would be called 49. You go down 48, 47. Let's say this is the 46th one. Okay, so it's four amino acids down from this really conserved residue. And this is where we have our serine. So we'd call this serine at position 207. So that's its actual position where you count from the amino terminus. It's in transmembrane domain 3, so we put that 3 there. And then we put 46, which just shows that it's four residues down from this really highly conserved amino acid that's in transmembrane domain 3 of the beta-2 adrenergic receptor, basically. So that's uh, a quite complicated naming system for G protein coupled receptors residues. Okay, but you will see it used. Really, the useful pieces of information are where it is within the polypeptide, this number here, that is very easy to understand. And then this number is quite helpful, it tells you which transmembrane domain it's in. Okay, so uh, now we've done that. Uh, let's just briefly talk about what happens when the ligand binds to this G-protein coupled receptor. So basically, the ligand will come in and bind uh, from uh, the extracellular side. Okay, so in comes the ligand. Now, what does this cause? Well, basically, what it's going to expose is a binding site for the G protein. So G protein coupled receptors uh, catalyze the activation of G proteins, specifically heterotrimeric G proteins, which will be the topic of the next video coming up. Okay, now when the ligand binds to the G protein coupled receptor, what it does is it triggers a conformational change in the G protein coupled receptor that then exposes the binding site into which these heterotrimeric G proteins can uh, bind, basically. And the binding site for heterotrimeric G proteins is basically made up 
from the three intracellular loops. So intracellular loop one, intracellular loop two, and intracellular loop three. These three intracellular loops here make up the binding domain for uh, the G protein um, that this G protein coupled receptor is going to interact with. Okay, and when the G protein coupled receptor binds its ligand, what happens is that this is exposed. So previously, when it had no ligand attached, uh, the G protein just could not bind in that binding site. It wasn't exposed, okay? But when the ligand binds, some conformational change will occur and it becomes exposed. Okay, but we'll deal with that in a much more detail in the next video. Okay, now what we want to turn our attention to is the classification of the G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, so they are classified into five main families, basically. So five families of G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, and these five families are, let's start with the main, the biggest and the main one. This is one that contains around 750 of the 800 uh, G protein coupled receptors. So this is by far the most important family. And this is the rhodopsin family. Okay, so named because rhodopsin is a member of this family. So the um, receptor for light, basically, the photoreceptor pigment, which is within uh, the rod and the cone cells, well, the rod cells very much so, uh, is uh, a member of this family. Okay, right. Uh, and uh, secondly, the next great family is the secretin family of G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, and don't worry, we'll discuss all of these in much more detail. We'll discuss their structure, uh, how they all differ from each other. They all have the same seven transmembrane domains, but they have different extracellular domains. Okay, uh, and uh, we'll discuss examples of each family as well. Okay, then uh, number three, uh, the glutamate family of G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, which obviously contains the metabotropic glutamate receptors, but also uh, the GABA B receptors. Uh, then the adhesion family of G protein coupled receptors, which interact with extracellular matrix proteins. And then finally, the frizzled, uh, whoops, frizzled, uh, and then taste 2 receptors uh, family. Okay, so this family is named after two of its key members, which are the frizzled receptor and the taste 2 receptor. And sometimes it's split into two separate families, but the more normal classification is to classify them as rhodopsin family, the secretin family, the glutamate family, the adhesion family, and the frizzled taste 2 family. Okay, and we'll look at the structures of each of these and how they bind ligand uh, in the next video.